Proverbs 19. <clears throat> Better a poor person who lives with integrity than someone who has deceitful lips and is a fool. Even zeal is not good without knowledge, and the one who acts hastily sins. A person's own foolishness leads him astray, yet his heart rages against the Lord. Wealth attracts many friends, but a poor person is separated from his friend. A false witness will not go unpunished, and one who utters lies will not escape. Many seek a ruler's favor, and everyone is a friend of one who gives gifts. All the brothers of a poor person hate him, how much more do his friends keep their distance from him? He may pursue them with words, but they are not, but they are not there. <clears throat> the one who acquires good sense loves himself. One who safeguards understanding finds success. A false witness will not go unpunished, and one who utters lies perishes. Luxury is not appropriate for a fool. How much less for a slave to rule over princes? A person's insight gives him patience, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. A king's rage is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. A foolish son is his father's ruin, and a wife's nagging is an endless dripping. A house and wealth are inherited from fathers, <clears throat> but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Laziness induces deep sleep, and a lazy person will go hungry. The one who keeps commands preserves himself. One who disregards his ways will die. Kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord, and he will give a reward to the lender. <clears throat> Discipline your son while there is hope. Don't set your heart on being the cause of his death. A person with intense anger bears the penalty. If you rescue him, you'll have to do it again. Listen to counsel and receive instruction so that you may be wise later in life. Many plans are in a person's heart, but the Lord's decree will prevail. What is desirable in a person is his fidelity. Better to be a poor person than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life. One will sleep at night without danger. The slacker buries his hand in the bowl. He doesn't even bring it back to his mouth. Strike a mocker, and the inexperienced learn a lesson. Rebuke the discerning, and he gains knowledge. The one who plunders his father and evicts his mother is a disgraceful and shameful son. If you stop listening to correction, my son, you will stray from the words of knowledge. A worthless witness mocks justice, and a wicked mouth swallows iniquity. Judgments are prepared for mockers and beatings for the backs of fools. Amen. You may be seated, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. If we have any visitors today, I'm Ben Keller, one of the elders, worship director. I help out with our youth as well. Please to continue our journey through the book of Proverbs as we look at this divinely inspired collection of wisdom that's right there in the middle of our Bibles. There's a lot of books in the Bible that have single lines or phrases or sentences that are so packed with truth and power that you can just extract those out and, and preach on those. Those, of course, are peppered all over the scripture. In fact, Spurgeon was famous for doing that. He didn't preach expositionally in the way that, that we do. He was a single text preacher, and obviously to good effect. So you can do that all through scripture. You can pull out a single sentence. And the book of Proverbs especially lends itself to that because really each proverb, as you can see as we go through it, each proverb could easily be its own sermon. And because we've been through, preaching through these a chapter at a time, that brings its own blessings and challenges. There's, there's liberty there. There's different ways you can preach Proverbs, different ways of handling them, different perspectives. And uh, so along those lines, what I'm going to do with 
Proverbs 19 today is I'm going to give us five reminders, and then I'm going to focus on three of the verses from uh, Proverbs 19. So five reminders and three verses to focus on. So I'm going to start with the five reminders. A reminder number one, translating Proverbs is challenging. Now, let's look at some phrases. This is going to be a little bit of, uh, usually preaching is a monologue. This portion is going to be a little bit dialogue because I need your help for this, okay? Here's a German phrase, ich verstehe nur Bonhof. And the only reason I can pronounce that half decent is because I took German in high school. <laughs> Gave me no competitive edge in life. What's the literal translation of that? I only understand the train station. Now, here's my question to you. What do you think that means? This is a saying in German. The literal translation is, I only understand the train station. What do you think it means? Just shout out a guess. Schedules. Schedules. What was it? I heard something else. I don't, who said I don't get it? All right. And she didn't read this in advance. I know that's my wife. <laughs> Here's what it means. I don't understand a thing about what that person is saying. <laughs> you should use this with me a lot, Dora. I don't... Okay, here's a Swedish phrase. Now, as we get into different languages, I, I listen to the pronunciations. They're going to be butchered. I apologize to any Swedes, Thai persons, or Latvians here. So, sw Swedish phrase, der inja kupa isen. Literal translation, there's no cow on the ice. Now, what do you think that means? This is a phrase in S Swedish. What do you think? You're on thin ice. It's not, thick. it's not thick enough. There's no cow on the ice. Any other guesses? Cow is underwater. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what it means. And this one you might get when you think about it. It means there's no need to worry. <laughs> because obviously you can picture, well, if the cow was on the ice, that would be a subject of worry. <laughs> okay, here's a Thai phrase. Yeah, just go ahead and read it. Um, so, Chadna Dan Bai Bai. Literal translation, one afternoon in your next reincarnation. <laughs> what, do you think that, what do you think that means? That's the literal translation. What do you think it means? Say again. Yeah. What it means is it's never going to happen. Okay. Last one, a Latvian phrase. And it looks, in English, in our letters, it looks like edge, bakot, or something, but the, the way they pronounce that is a vekoet. And the literal translation is go pick mushrooms. <laughs> what do you think that means? Get lost, get out of here. What'd you say? Go pound sand. <laughs> well, that's its own idiom. Uh, you're, you're close. It means leave me alone. Go pick mushrooms. Leave me alone. Now, why do I, why do I mention these things? The divinely inspired authors of Proverbs, mostly Solomon, but there's a couple else as well, they spoke and they wrote in ancient Hebrew. So just like German, Swedish, Thai, Latvian, Hebrew has its own peculiarities, idioms, phrases, slang, so to speak. And while the book of Proverbs is not poetry per se, it is wisdom literature, and therefore it's not just straight narrative. So you can have this imagery and this slang that takes skill to bring into English. Let's look at one example. Let's look at verse 7 from today. So here's how the King James renders it. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words yet they are wanting to him. Now that's 400 years ago. 
And to our modern ears, that might be a little like, uh, I'm not sure what's being driven out there. Okay, let's go to the New American Standard. All the brother, brothers of a poor person hate him. How much more do his friends abandon him? He pursues them with words, but they are gone. English Standard Version. All a poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursues them with words, but does not have them. Again, we're, we're circling it here, but it's, it's not 100% clear Christian standard Bible all the brothers of a poor person hate him how much more do his friends keep their distance from him he may pursue them with words but they are not there and then the New Living Translation the relatives of the poor despise them how much more will their friends avoid them though the poor plead with them their friends are gone all of these are good translations but you can see the challenge the New American Standard, for example, is going to try as closely as it can to hew to a word-for-word -word interpretation approach. So you'll get that last phrase, he pursues them with words, but they are gone. Whereas the New Living Translation team at Tyndale is going to try to supply some of the meaning to you uh, more than a strict word-for-word -word translation will do. So they'll render that Though the poor plead with them, their friends are gone. There's risk and reward in each methodology. I have great respect for that whole spectrum of interpretive attempts. They're all trying to do something well. And I would say this, and I know Lincoln would agree with me, he's the only guy in the room who's actually taken Hebrew, that um, when someone tells you they, they, they appreciate a word-for-word -word translation, there is no strict word-for-word -word translation. You're always importing some meaning because some meaning is going to adhere, is going to join itself to the words that are being used. And so thankfully, we live in a time, more than any other time in human history, when you have an abundance of tools really at your fingertips, just even in your phone, to make these comparisons and help you understand what is the text driving at here. And in the book of Proverbs, that's especially valuable because, again, it's not strict narrative. You're dealing with idioms, phrases, sometimes what we would call slang. But it's the Word of God, so we want to uh, try and understand it the best we can. So translating Proverbs is challenging. Reminder number two, Proverbs tells us to study Proverbs. This is a reminder from the beginning of the book, which we went through the first nine chapters a few years ago. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance. By exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. So we have kind of a command right at the outset of the book. Explore it. Pursue its meaning. Reminder number three. Christ is the wisdom of God. Paul tells the Corinthians, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Not just Christ has wisdom. Christ is the wisdom of God. That's why we have complete free reign when we're preaching through Proverbs to bring Christ into it over and over and over again because Christ is the wisdom of God. So there's a sense in which this whole book is about him. 
And Paul tells the uh, Colossian church, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So pursuit of Christ is just not some esoteric religious exercise. Okay, well, you have your Jesus, and uh, that's great for you. No, no, no. The Bible's making a claim here. All wisdom, all knowledge is under the feet of Christ and in his purview. Reminder four, Christ is the word of God. While the Bible is the written word of God, Jesus is the living, incarnate word of God. The very first chapter of John's gospel lays this out for us. Remember, that was the last gospel that was written. John had about 50 years to think about that before the Holy, Insp Holy Spirit inspired him to lay these words down. That's why it reads very differently. By that time you're halfway through John, he's already in the last week of Christ's life. He's very deliberate about what he wants to focus on. John 1 is just like Genesis 1. You don't read it and just like, okay, well, that was great. No, 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 no. Slow down. There's big stuff going on in John 1. There's big stuff going on in Genesis 1. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Every word there in the Greek is fundamentally important. This is not a secondarily important verse. There are whole cults that have started by messing with the Greek in this verse inserting the word was a God. There's a whole cult built on that. That's not what it says. The word was God. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So remember, now that you know he wrote this 50 years later, his experience being there in the transfiguration had an effect on him, didn't it? He's still putting it in the first chapter of his gospel 50 years later. We've seen his glory. I was there. And I heard Peter making his stupid remarks about building tabernacles because he didn't know what else to say. I was there. And I say that because that's what the Bible says. It says Peter didn't know what to say, so he just started babbling. And our fifth reminder, Proverbs has a topical melody. Now you can divide the individual Proverbs from chapter 19 into topical buckets. In fact, uh, they fit pretty neatly into two groups of, you could make two groups of three alliterated categories. First, there's Proverbs about decrees, there's Proverbs about discernment, and there's Proverbs about discipline. And next, there's Proverbs about finance, there's Proverbs about falsehood, and there's Proverbs about fools. So, why didn't Solomon arrange them that way? Have you ever thought about that? Lincoln. Would you come up to the keyboard pretty please? Now Lincoln is going to play something. I've asked him to play something on the keyboard. So whenever you're ready. Okay. What is that? Okay. How do you know it's Amazing Grace? The melody. That's how you know it's Amazing Grace. Now, I'm going to have Lincoln play one more time.
Now, he played the same rhythm. The melody changed, didn't it? That's the exact same rhythm he played first time around. The melody changed. He was only playing D second time around. In fact, when he played it the second time, that's an unrecognizable melody. It's the rhythm of Amazing Grace, but all he's playing is D. Da, 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 da. So the melody is lost. Thank you, Lincoln. Appreciate that. So the book of Proverbs is a melody of Proverbs. If Solomon had arranged them all topically, the melody would be lost. The first note of Amazing Grace is D. Is D ever played again in the song? Yes, of course it is. When you come across a proverb on truthfulness or laziness, is that the only time those proverbial notes are played? No, it's not the only time. They pop up again and again in the melody of the book. But this book on wisdom has wisdom in its very construction because it has memorable melodies. Yes, they recur. Yes, they repeat. But throughout the book. So the Lord using Solomon as his instrument knows this is the best way for our mind to absorb all these things. You have a proverb about finance. And then a couple verses later, you have another proverb about finance. And then maybe 15 verses later, you have another proverb about finance. Otherwise, you would get this is the first proverb on marriage, this is the second proverb on marriage, this is the third proverb on, right? And immediately you're like, eh, I'm zoning out. That's why it's not arranged that way. We would tune out. The Lord knows the human beings that he made. Okay, that was our five reminders. Now we turn to three verses to focus on. And that's going to be verses 11, 17, and 21. Verse 11, a person's insight gives him patience, and his virtue is to overlook an offense. Paul tells the Thessalonian church, Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So, Paul says, in light of that, encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. So I want to build up and encourage our Pastor James in this regard. Uh, back in 2014, I was just getting my feet wet as our worship director here at Refuge. It's hard to believe it's been over 10 years now that uh, I've been in that role. I'm very blessed with the skill and the talent and the discipline that we have uh, with everybody involved in worship. Vocalists, musicians, audio, pro presenter, camera. We have a wonderful and, and talented bunch. It hasn't always been an unbroken chain of bliss. <laughs> especially at the outset. I don't know if you know this. Sometimes people are a pain in the rear. Were you aware of this? I don't know. Is, has someone alerted the media? I certainly know I can be a pain in the rear. And I'm guessing the fact that we can be very annoying to each other is not news to you. As Al Mohler would say, we live in a Genesis 3 world. But there was an individual long gone from refuge, whose name I won't share to protect the guilty, who had really gone off on me on email. This person was disrespectful way out of line, and kind of just a font of unwisdom. So I took it, I absorbed the blows, I responded with a polite, thanks for the feedback, I'll take that in consideration. But I had to get it off my chest to somebody. So I fired off an email to James, ranting, listing about 43 reasons why this person was an ignoramus, and James then responded to my Tolstoy-length email by saying this. 
I'm trying to be Proverbs 19 about this, and I hope you will too. It's a virtue to overlook an offense. Dang it. <laughs> and this is where prudential wisdom comes in. James wasn't saying, nor does he believe, that the Bible calls for us to be a pincushion for insults for the remainder of our days in all occasions and circumstances. Context and godly wisdom will determine how and whether this proverb applies. In my case, Proverbs 19.11 did apply. I believe the Lord was telling me through James, stand down, Ben. There may be other times when if you're defending someone who has been wronged or uh, for any number of reasons that the appropriate thing is to not overlook that offense but rather deal with it in a Christ-like manner. But there are those times when you just need to let that go and let God sort it out. And we live in a world that I mean, I only have the perspective of my lifetime, but it seems like we live in a world that is more ready to be offended than at any time in human history. And this is, of course, made infinitely worse by the social media algorithms that thrive on everyone taking offense at everything at all times. That's how they make their money. So I don't think we have a problem right now at unhelpfully or unhealthily absorbing offenses. Rather, we probably all need to work a little, perhaps a lot, on overlooking offenses, assuming the best, not the worst, searching for good motives, not ill motives, giving the benefit of the doubt before we pounce, and before we pronounce. So this is a great verse, Proverbs 19, 11, a great verse for Christians, certainly in America, certainly in 2024, to meditate on. Verse 17, kindness to the poor is a loan to the Lord, and he will give a reward to the lender. <clears throat> it's the poor that are in view in this verse, of course, but I think we ought to take a little moment of self-assessment and evaluation by looking just a little more broadly. Christians should be known by their generosity, miser should never be attributed to a Christian, skinflint should never be attributed to a Christian. In my estimation, Christians should be the best tippers the most gracious when you're out and about. Christians should be willing to give early and often without expectation of recompense. I often, in speaking with my parents, refer to the fact that they always ha have had a greased checkbook. And their generosity is marked by the fact that nearly as soon as finances come in, they are generously, even sacrificially, dispensing it towards family or friends or others that are in need and have a particular need that they can address. My siblings and I have been blessed by this. My kids have been blessed by this. And of course, this generosity is not always in the form of dollars. Often, it's in the more precious commodity of concerted prayer on our behalf. And Dora's parents have been a real model of this as well, showing great generosity to their kids and their grandkids. Just this week I finalized some conversations with a, a dear elderly saint by the name of John. And John was a longtime pastor and leader at a wonderful and solid Bible teaching church on the Olympic Peninsula. For many years, almost 30 years now, uh, John was a direct and loving support of my brother, uh, both financially and spiritually. He was a faithful physical presence when my brother was imprisoned out at uh, Clallam Bay by Forks. 
And after that, he's been a faithful visitor uh, with my brother via phone and mail. And the fact is that unless the Lord intervenes, uh, John is dying. And he is making sure that he is fully spent, literally and metaphorically, before he goes to glory. And so he was arranging with me and my parents some disbursement of funds to continue to help my brother's somewhat meager needs in prison for after he's gone. Now, to me, that is a pitch-perfect example of godliness and Christ-likeness. To know that your money is not your money. To know that the best thing you can do with your finances is to apply them where the needs of the kingdom are most keenly felt and where the Lord himself directs us to put them in the scripture. Are you helping those that are in prison? Are you helping those that are poor? Are you helping the orphans? Are you helping the widows? There's several strong verses where Jesus, in a manner of saying, says, unless you're doing those things, I don't want to talk to you. We don't have much to talk about, unless you got those bases covered first. Every week or so, I try to post a little encouraging thought or scripture meditation on social media. And the thing with social media is, that, of course, you know, better, for better or worse, once it's out there, anywhere in the world, you can access it, assuming that your posts are public. And over the last year, I've had some providential interactions where a handful of people have reached out from across the globe to ask me for help, for spiritual help, for prayerful help, for scriptural help, and for financial help if they're in desperate straits. In other words, kindness to the poor, as the verse says. And so I wanted to make you aware of this in some general ways because I want to honor what the Lord says in his Sermon on the Mount about the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. So I'm exhorting, but I'm not boasting. I am going to boast about you guys in a minute, but I'm trying not to boast about what I've done. I'm just giving you a, a window here. So the Lord has airdropped some people into my life. I didn't seek them out. And I had the normal reticence that you would have when people are airdropped into your life. Who is this? What's their agenda? But then as you get to know them and become friendly with them and know this is a true brother or sister in Christ, it helps. And so I want to introduce you first to Asif. So Asif is a brother in Christ who lives in Pakistan and who teaches and preaches in a village there, mostly to widows and orphans. And you can see in the picture I provided that he's handing out some food to, he's got a few dozen orphans there that he's, uh, he's got his dry erase board set up teaching in, you, you see the wonderful amenities in this classroom? You've got dirt, you've got open air, but here's a brother trying to feed the kids and teach the kids in Pakistan. And I mention Asif because he's an example that this relationship is not a one-way street. I receive encouragement and prayerful support from these brothers as much or more than they do from me. So I wanted to play for you a voicemail I received from Asif just this last Friday a couple days ago. Happy Friday, brother. And God bless you, God bless your family, God bless your business, God bless your country, and God bless you all. Amen. So he'll send me messages like this. Now I want to introduce you to Alex. Alex lives in the Gambia, which is on the western coast of Africa. And he reached out asking for help, again, a very unusual, out of the blue request, his family is Muslim. He had become a Christian, is at the very beginning stage of, of being a Christian. And all this just flowed to me because he messaged me. He's like, here's this guy on the internet talking about scripture. Maybe he knows something. So he messages me and says, hey, um, I wondered if you can help me. So this was 
I don't know, almost a year ago now. And so his family is Muslim and has essentially disowned him because of his faith, because he's a Christian now. And so we talked through, well, what's the best thing to do? And so I said, well, I did some research. I said, there's some solid brothers out. Can you make your way out to the coast? Uh, because there's uh, a few more churches there. I connected him with a, a uh, Gambian Presbyterian pastor, a great guy who they connected. And let's see if we can kind of get him out here and get his footing here. Again, I'm, I'm just, I just live in Snohomish. I don't, even, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to help this guy that the Lord has put in my life. So he's moved out there, and he's slowly making his way. Um, I've been of some modest financial support to him, and I mean modest. I'm, <laughs> it's modest. So I've also slowly been sending him, he doesn't, have much in the way of Bibles or materials, so I use WhatsApp. So each week I send him like a half chapter in John's Gospel, just slowly working his way through it so he can read it. He's always very appreciative, thankful. And recently he let me know, well, I'm going to this church now. It's right on the border with uh, Nigeria. And so I said, okay, that's good to hear. Uh, tell me about it. And then I looked it up. And uh, I did my due diligence, and it's not a great church. And uh, they're big on word faith theology, um, also known as the prosperity gospel, um, which is ubiquitous in Africa. And it's a scourge and a blight. It's everywhere. And it causes great confusion. So I sent Alex a message, and I said, uh, uh, I really encourage you to check everything you're hearing in light of scripture. I have some concerns about this church that you're going to. Um, and he sent me a voice message back, very kind and respectful, where he expressed his desire to honor my request that he be cautious. And I'll play that for you in a minute. I'll let you know when you, when you watch the video, when you hear him, he refers to me as dad in the message, okay? He has done that almost since our first connection because he lost his family. So very early on, he says, will you be my dad? Well, that's heartbreaking. How can I say no to that? I'm, I feel completely inadequate, but I was like, yes, you can call me dad. It's, it's okay. So that's why he says dad in what you're about to see. So here's Alex. No problem, dad. No problem. In fact, the church that I was in is a, is a Nigerian church. The pastor there sometimes there are certain things this mountain of fire and i don't know crusade of what how they call it sometimes they do it in the evening around five you know um, it's it's kind of weird though the things that they preach sometimes in it and the mode of worshiping in 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 which they do i kind of question it but uh, i believe i will i will send you a video one of these days uh, to see you actually how things are going and see you what you feel about the entire situation. Thank you so much. I will take heed to what you say. So, what a kind and teachable spirit, huh? I mean, I'm talking to him from halfway across the world. He appreciates my advice. He takes my counsel. He's listening to what I'm saying. Finally, I want to introduce you to Navid. This is another brother from Pakistan, and this is where you guys come in. He's also responsible for a large contingent of widows and orphans and often has uh, needs for the barest necessities for them and their livelihood. And recently he made a request to me about providing Bibles and Christian literature that the kids were in need of. And uh, to make a long story short, for just a few hundred dollars, uh, we could support several dozen of these uh, orphans with a full range of Bibles and um, Christian materials in their language. So I brought this need to our consistory. I asked them to trust me that this was a person worthy of support. It was a good opportunity. I was not surprised at all that our elders and deacons unanimously supported providing what to us is not a large amount of money uh, for purposes of blessing these wonderful people in Pakistan. So I wanted to share with you briefly this thank you to me and to you from Naveed. Thank you, Lord, 
thank you jesus provide the holy bibles and uh, all children's book uh, thanks uh, my brother and all church god bless you all hallelujah there's navid of course we should exercise due diligence i remember during college uh, going to dinner down at the Seattle waterfront. And while I was walking from my car to the dinner, a person approached me with a, a down on his luck story, asked me for $10. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have, I mean, which was true. I don't, I just had a card. I don't have any cash. So I had to decline. And then on the way back to the car after dinner, the same person approached me not remembering that he had spoken to me before, and gave me an entirely different story about why he needed $10. And so I said, you know, I think the best thing is probably for you to just get your story straight and figure that out first. And, uh, and I just went on my way. So we need to use the good sense that the Lord gave us, that there are people that want to take advantage. And, and, uh, but our disposition ought to be one of sacrificial generosity toward anyone in true need and to be kind again in every way uh, I'm trying to be kind to these people prayerfully sometimes they've called and asked me will you call me and and can we pray together they're encouraged by the scriptures that I share it's not just a financial transaction but I'm trying to do what this verse stipulates be kind to the poor verse 21 many plans are in a person's heart but the Lord's decree will prevail. Kings have plans. Presidents have plans. Prime ministers have plans. Captains of industry have plans. Influential philosophers and scholars have plans. Cultural influencers have plans. But the Lord's decree will prevail. What's the Lord's decree? Well, the Lord's decree can be expressed in two ways. The first way the Lord's decree is expressed is in how he governs all of creation under the umbrella of his divine providence. Listen to the scriptural wisdom of the Westminster divines. God, who created everything, also upholds everything. He directs, regulates, and governs every creature. Even kings, yep. Even presidents, yep. Every creature, action, and thing, from the greatest to the least, by his completely wise and holy providence. He does so in accordance with his infallible foreknowledge and the voluntary, unchangeable purpose of his own will, all to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. God's providence reveals his almighty power, unknowable wisdom, and infinite goodness. His providence extends even to the fall and to all other sins of angels and men. These sins are not simply allowed by God, but are bound, ordered, and governed by him in the fullness of of his wisdom and power, so that they fulfill his own holy purposes. However, the sinfulness still belongs to the creature and does not proceed from God, whose holy righteousness does not and cannot cause or prove sin. That's the first way that God exercises his decree. Solomon saw that decree, he knew that decree, he experienced that decree, 
and is, in his wisdom he plumbed the depths of that decree. But the second way the Lord's decree is expressed is even more important and more glorious than the first. And this way, this aspect of the Lord's decree, Solomon, like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, like Moses, like David, could only see through the eyes of faith. And it goes like this. Before the creation of the world, according to his eternal, unchangeable plan, and the hidden purpose and good pleasure of his will, God has chosen in Christ those of mankind who are predestined to life and to everlasting glory. He has done this, listen, solely out of his own mercy and love and completely to the praise of his wonderful grace. This choice was completely independent of his foreknowledge of how his created beings would be or act. Neither their faith, nor good works, nor perseverance had any part in influencing his selection. Just as God has determined that the elect shall be glorified, so too, in the eternal and completely free purpose of his will, he has foreordained all the means by which that election is accomplished. And so, those who are chosen, having fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ. They are effectually called to faith in Christ by his Spirit, working in them at the right time. And they are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Only the elect and no others are redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. That's a pretty important decree. That's why we're here today. Amazing Grace was just one of the hundreds of hymns that John Newton gifted to the church and to future generations. I'll close with another inspired by the Apostle Paul's Mediterranean Sea Voyage related in Acts 27. This is the hymn that Newton wrote about that passage. If Paul in Caesar's court must stand... He need not fear the sea, secured from harm on every hand by the divine decree. Although the ship in which he sailed by dreadful storms was tossed, the promise over all prevailed, and not a life was lost. Jesus, the God whom Paul adored, who saves in time of need, was then confessed by all on board a present help indeed. Though neither sun nor stars were seen, Paul knew the Lord was near, and faith preserved his soul serene while others shook for fear. Believers thus are tossed about on life's tempestuous main, but grace assures beyond a doubt they shall their port attain. They must, they shall appear one day before their th Savior's throne. The storms they meet with by the way, but make his power known. Their passage lies across the brink of many a threatening wave. The world expects to see them sink, but Jesus lives to save. Lord, Though we are but feeble worms, yet since thy word stands fast, we'll venture through a thousand storms to see thy face at last. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you for the anchor that you are.
that the Apostle Paul could see through the eyes of faith. My good God is working out his decrees, even as this ship is being tossed around. And Lord, we know that we all come into this space this morning having any number of needs and feeling uh, in any number of ways tossed about, whether reports of illness or strife or difficulty or lack or financial struggles or relational struggles. The waves keep coming. But Lord, we know this word is true. And we know that through the eyes of faith that you will accomplish your purposes. And because you're a good, sovereign, holy, righteous God, we can depend on you to hold our hands when ours is weak and slippery and prone to fail. But that's not the important hand. The important hand is the one that's holding us. And we know that will never fail. So, Lord, we praise you and thank you. We pray this morning that you put in our hearts a conviction to overlook an offense, a conviction to be kind to the poor, a conviction to read and explore and study your word, much of which we simply didn't have time to plumb the depths of this morning. And help us to rest in the good news of a God who decrees, not a God who attempts and gives it the old college try. No, we serve a God who decrees and accomplishes. So we thank you for redemption accomplished and applied. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for allowing us to be in your presence, to fill the room with praises, and thanksgiving. Help us to continue to do so, not only this morning, but this week, in the privacy of our homes, in our prayer closets, in every way. Help us to lift you high. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.